This is Change Over Time, a podcast where I think historically about things I geek. I'm Daniel Horowitz Garcia, the alternative historian. And going to go out and throw? What? Oh, call shot. Eyeball. Okay. He rolled a one. 91. Yeah, my name is David Lester. Um, and I've been doing the role playing game thing now for closing in on 30 plus years. I am non typical. Um, I think Bill Engvall said it the best. I'm 15 degrees off cool. If I had to describe myself to someone who had never heard of me and didn't know a thing about me, I would tell them this Bill Engvall is that guy that's just 15 degrees off cool, all right? Yeah, cool people, we all know them. They're right there, right in the middle. They dress the right way, they say the right things, they're never, fla- you know, they're just always in control. I'm just, <laughs> just a little off. I'm kind of a dork. I mean, I'm not like, you know. <laughs> I'm not like Dungeons and Dragons dork, all right? But just a little dork. <laughs> So, is this guy nearly dead, or is he, like, dead? He's about 25%. If you all get around. Down? Like, and this one? No, he's 75% three. down. Oh, okay, so he's 25 left. And the other one is about 25 down. Sounds about right. Today, I'm geeking role-playing, RPGs. What you're hearing in the background is a session in progress. This is my gaming group, and we're in combat. We won, but the fight wasn't the point. In fact, the fight was unnecessary. We entered the battle because we entered the wrong room. Before we go any further, I want to acknowledge how geeky that sounds. I think there is something at the center here that is worth exploring, and I would like for you to work through the awkward dorkness of it all. From the outside, role-playing games may look like a chance for people to come together, be something they're not, and kill things. But a good game is about more than that. It's about story. Everyone involved is telling a story about characters and about a world. And these can be amazing stories. You said you're going for the eye, right? And he's got full plate armor on, so your throwing star comes in at the side, straight in through the eye hole, but you ended up dealing only actually two points of damage. That was still cool. I mean, I had. Yeah, so, yeah, did you see that? <laughs> cut him right above the person the guiding this process is the game master, or GM. David Lester is a GM of this group. This is him. Okay, so you just healed him? Yep. Okay, so we're going to start with the first one. He pulls out his spear, and as he comes to about here, where he can reach you now, he doesn't use the spear to stab, he uses it as a swinging motion to hit him and try to hit you with it. Okay. <laughs> That's Sorry, guys. It's actually better than Comedian oh, Bill Engvall's take on Dungeons and Dragons is not new. Dork and D&D have been synonymous for decades, but it's almost certain that you know someone who plays a tabletop game. Stephen Colbert, Anderson Cooper, Vin Diesel, Judy Dench, The Rock, Stephen King, Felicia Day, and others have all talked about how much they love the game and how much they've gotten out of it. Before celebrities were playing RPGs, kids like me and Dave were rolling weirdly shaped dice. Dave has been an active player and GM for more than 30 years. After high school, I stopped playing. Dave never did. In fact, seven years ago, he created his own game system called the Multiverse. I stopped playing after high school but I did come back. As many as 3 million people in the U.S. are playing some type of role-playing game. What is it about RPGs that keeps people hooked? I sat down and conducted an oral history interview with Dave to find out. Hey, if it goes wrong, you could go out the window. So first, is it him just hitting you? All right. All right. Which, again, I rolled terribly. So uh, my first game would have been in somewhere around Halloween of... 1978. Basic Dungeons and Dragons, the original <clears throat> Red Box set. Uh, I had a friend at school who um, his sister had the game, and she was maybe four or five years older. So he told me about it, invited me over to try it. Um, <clears throat> we played for maybe an hour or so, and I was hooked from there. Literally that weekend, my dad was going through the I think it was Sears catalog or something like that, looking at um, different games to get for a family game night. And that happened to be one of the games. And I was all excited, told him how cool it was. So they went out and bought it. He picked up the manual, which of course is 60 something page manual at that time. Disinterest to almost everyone. He got halfway through the first page where he found out that there was no way to win and there was no longer any interest. If there was no way to win, 
they didn't want to play it. So, uh, in kindergarten, I got hooked on uh, The Hobbit, the cartoon Hobbit to start with. Casey Kasem was voicing a lot of the characters and so forth. So I, w I was really into the fantasy stuff to begin with, and then this, this role-playing thing caught up in the fantasy. It was a, a huge storytelling and hobby thing for me. So I had um, started playing it. I had almost immediately, I had four or five people who um, wanted to play. But because of the age, which I think at that point I would have been nine or so, I was the only one in the group capable of both understanding what it was and coming up with the stories. So essentially the very, very second time I played, I was GMing. And in these this phenomenal amount of time I've been playing, I don't think I've been a player for more than, maybe I've had five characters, and it's rare that I get to play more than maybe four sessions back to back before I'm GMing again. I should probably explain some of the concepts. As I said, a GM, or Game Master, is the guide to the game. He or she lays out a narrative framework, the larger story, also known as the campaign. Players have their character, rogue, wizard, warriors, what have you, and the characters go out on the campaign. Players only play their character. The GM plays everything else. So what is a campaign like? The introduction to Thacko the movie explains it a little bit. What is a role-playing game? Well, remember when you were kids and you used to play games of let's pretend, like cops and robbers? A role-playing game is kind of like that. Remember how some of the kids would pretend to be cops while others would take on the role of robbers? A role-playing game is kind of like that. But remember when you used to get into fights? Someone would get shot and they'd throw a tantrum, kicking and screaming, shouting that there was no possible way he could have been killed. Well, a role-playing game is exactly like that. Yes, players do get whiny sometimes. But it's the GM's job to follow the rules. But not so much that it kills the story. Threading this needle is a difficult and thankless job. And because of that, most people would rather be a player than a GM. Dave likes a mix. I really enjoy GMing, which is why typically I end up being the GM all the time. But it's nice to um, get to apply some of the things as a GM. I keep thinking, man, if the players only did X, and then if I get to play as a character, I get to do X, which I think is, this, is the common trait for everyone who role plays. You see some story or you watch something on the TV and you're thinking, I would do this different. And I, I think that's the hook that gets most people into it. At the end, it is a collaborative story. Players may not always realize it, but it gives me a, a lot of joy to have them um, do something in the game world that impacts the world, not just impacts their character, but changes how the world works. A role-playing game is a group of people creating an epic tale. Storytelling drives the game. Players are trying to tell the story of their character, but at least in Dave's games, they are also telling the story of a world. I love it when a player comes up with something I have not thought of. For my world, I have about 10 years of what's going to happen ahead of where the players are. But that is 10 years of what's going to happen assuming X occurs, as in nobody interferes and so forth. So when players interfere, they can change the story pretty significantly um, for that 10 years forward. This doesn't mean that just because someone plays an RPG, they are a great storyteller. After 30 years of gaming, Dave has come to the conclusion that there's always someone in the group with the imagination of a 12-year-old boy, regardless of their age or gender. They're going to be focused on getting the most money, getting the most women, um, acting quite literally as if they have a mental disorder. <laughs> there are at least two or three in my current group. I could run a campaign just letting them come up with what they're going to do. But at the same time, unless they know the world as well as I do, it gets a little overwhelming for them to come up with, well, this is what I want to have happen. That's why there needs to be a GM. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of people having a conversation. This is fine for a party, but the problem in the game is that the stories get boring without a GM. Stories need conflict. The GM introduces that conflict in a way that pushes a story forward. Without a GM, the players create their own conflict. But instead of pushing the story forward, it just makes chaos. So one of the things I've learned after 30 years of GMing is being nice to the players bores them. If I'm nice more than two sessions in a row to the players, they lose interest. They start wandering around, screwing off, creating their own um, disasters. So the longer I leave things going smoothly, the more likely the characters are to 
I don't know, try to take over a town or murder the barkeep or <laughs> something to cause something to happen. I like to try to put the conflict in there as um, something that, that actually fits a story. When you just let the players run wild, there's not a lot of players who are so invested in the story of their characters and are logically consistent within the story of their characters that I can run a game just around what they want to do. For my world, I have about 10 years of what's going to happen ahead of where the players are. But that is 10 years of what's going to happen assuming X occurs, as in nobody interferes and so forth. So when players interfere, they can change the story pretty significantly um, for that 10 years forward. This brings us to one reason why I wanted to talk to Dave. He created his own game. We'll talk about this right after the break. Oral history is learning about the past by engaging with people who lived it. It's about critically examining memory and narrative. You don't have to be a historian to listen to great oral history. Amplify is an oral history podcast network bringing podcasting to the field of oral history. The network is spreading the word on great oral history projects. Podcasts like Press Record, The Other Side of the Mic, and The Wisdom Project are all members. So is Change Over Time. Head over to AmplifyVoices.org to find out more. Now let's get back to the episode. Longtime game master David Lester created his own game called the Multiverse. Creating a game from scratch is not as uncommon as it seems. With the birth of the internet and the loosening of some copyright claims, there has been a growth in independent RPGs. Dave's game builds on the fantasy epic nature of Dungeons and Dragons, but changes assumptions and gameplay in a way that favors a character-centered story. When you're creating a character for the multiverse, the basic premise to start with is because you only get a few points to pick skills to begin with, you figure out who your character is when the game starts. And that's supposed to be shortly after you've reached adulthood in general. So you haven't had a lot of time to learn a whole bunch of skills. And as you play, because you get more points to buy, buy or improve skills as you go on, you get to alter your character to fit the story that's happening. I wanted to make a role-playing system that could be for any genre. So that you would have a base set of rules that could then be branched off to any genre or any mix of genre. So you could have it go anything from non-magical um, Arthurian legend or primeval caveman type uh, adventures to westerns to steampunk to styles like He-Man, which is combined science and magic, um, to pure science fiction. I was getting frustrated when like third edition came out how often TSR and the other game companies were throwing together the same game with just slightly different or altered rules enough that you have to spend hundreds of dollars rebuying everything. I got frustrated with the limitations of classed systems, which at the time I started building this, every system was a class system. You, you were a fighter, you were a soldier, you were a aircraft pilot or something. You always had this very very rigid set of things that you could do and every character who was a fighter was exactly the same skill set wise and because you have the same skills you tend to be the same so i wanted to come up with a system that um, you were just a person who picked up a set of skills uh, if you were going to be a soldier that was part of your choice as a personality for your character and then you would pick up skills that would support that rather than i'm a soldier so i have this set of six skills Dave started building the multiverse in 2010. Even after seven years, the game is still years away from being released. He has to create enough rules, creatures, and spells that the game is self-contained, meaning he could hand the rules to someone and they could run their own game independently. This pace isn't a problem. Although Dave plans on selling the game, he doesn't plan on becoming a giant RPG company. So a lot of people might think of it as like an actual business plan or so forth. For me, it would be, um, I guess the way to say it is like an artist or like a musician who doesn't do it for the money, just for the, the love of it. And when you get to a certain point, you share it. When you're comfortable with this song or this piece of art, you, you share it, not because you're expecting to make anything out of it. Back to the question that began this episode. Why does he do this? Well, for the love. More specifically, love of good stories. Even more specifically, the love of creating his own stories. The further I got into the rules, the more open it allowed characters and even the stories i was creating to be 
because it allowed me to set what was going on completely. I didn't have to argue with people because some TSR novel was published and said this happened and I, I could come up with my own things. Dave has a theory, one that explains why he continued to game when others stopped. Creating stories is something we do as children. Most of us leave it behind when we reach adulthood. We become focused on what we're supposed to be doing. Dave kept doing what he wanted. I've always had this theory that the majority of humanity has this idea of what you're allowed to do at each age. And it's like every 10 years. So when you're in your 20s, you're allowed to do X. In your 30s, you're allowed to do X. In your 40s, you're allowed to do X. I apparently never got that book. I don't understand why certain things are limited to certain ages. Why should I, because I hit a certain age, give up something I'm interested in or love? So I kind of refuse to follow the, um, the general American idea of who you are supposed to be at certain ages. We grow up. I mean, if we don't grow up, we, we don't end up having our own places to live. We, <laughs> we, we can't um, live on our own. We need somebody to take care of us. So I've grown up. I'm responsible. I have the job. I have you know, all the things that people say that you should have. You know, I've been married. I've owned a house. All of that kind of stuff I've done, but I didn't see why I had to give up everything else for it. Could he stop? What would it take to stop? Could the love go away? That would require no vision and no hearing. <laughs> it would be about the time that I could. Or if I'm completely senile. And then you could probably put me in a corner and I'd think I am. Okay, guys, let's go shut up. Come on, okay, it's time to start. Now who needs a pencil? Everyone, fine, here you go. You should have leveled up your characters. How come you didn't? Do you even want to go on this adventure? No. It's the DM's lament. The dungeon master's affliction. Resigned to the fate that I'm my friend's referee. And the chaperone and mother. No, I didn't ask for this. But who else will take care of these adult babies? You can find more information about Change Over Time at changeovertimepodcast.com. I also tweet at Daniel Altist. Take a moment to rate this five stars. It helps people find the podcast. Safe travels. The Dungeon Master's Affliction Designed to the fate that I'm my friend's reverie And their chaperone and mother No, I didn't ask for this But who else will take care of these adult babies?